Hi, this is Mark Crawford, and you're listening to the Sound Architect Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Architect Podcast. I am your host, Sam Hughes, and today I am joined by composer Mark Crawford. Thanks for joining me today, Mark. How are you? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm great. Absolute pleasure to have you. And I have to say, before we talk about the social dilemma, yeah. uh, I'm very excited to get to it because um, I watched it recently. It's a fascinating documentary. It's really, really eye-opening that I recommend everyone checks out. It's really, really good. Thanks, yeah. Obviously, with a fantastic soundtrack as well. Well, thank you very much, yeah. So before we dive too much into that, I just wanted to ask, how did your journey into music composition begin? Ooh, uh, well, it's a long and windy road, uh, as <laughs> most of these careers go. Um, uh, I think I got passionate about music uh, from a very early age, passionate about, passionate about music and film. Back in like elementary school, I just watched a, a ton of movies. Uh, my parents let me watch, you know, so many movies. Uh, I have a, I had an older sister who would listen to a lot of uh, film soundtracks while she studied, so I'd kind of listen in and oh, uh, nice. get inspired that way, um, and kind of uh, you know live live out my favorite movies through the film scores. Um, and then I'd also make movies. I I borrowed my parents' uh, VHS camera, and I just you know go around and kind of create little goofy movies and then oh man that takes me back yeah put a put a boom box <laughs> up to the camera and create like a my own soundtrack to the to the movies and that's like the first time i remember you know um seeing the relationship between film and, and music um pretty early on though yeah pretty pretty early on and then the the best part was really you know showing this to friends and family showing these little movies and getting the reaction out of them and i think that was like the the impetus for like the my full career, I think. Um, but, you know, I, I went on to um, go to study film in, in college. Um, I loved, you know, learning about story and learning about all aspects. I went to CU in Boulder, and um, uh, their specialty is really uh, abstract and experimental film. So I kind of got to uh, expand my, uh, my look and my view on films a bit there. Oh, nice. And then uh, kind of went into, right after college, just went into like a big uh, stint of, you know, just doing a bunch of uh, commercials and uh, short documentaries. Uh, and throughout all of that, I just scored a lot of those films and just got the practice um, that eventually led me to scoring documentary films. Yeah, that's awesome. What a little, I, I'm surprised how early you even started at such a young age. Yeah, I know. I, I, I didn't really think about that until maybe like this year. Because you don't really s stop and think, you know, it's like... Uh, no, yeah, of course. You don't really yeah. kind of think about the journey until a while, you know, until a while later. Yeah, why am I Why am I doing this? How did I get <laughs> here? <laughs> yeah, how did I get... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the talky heads. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I look back and I, I just think about what, what makes me passionate about what I do and what makes me keep wanting to do this uh every single day and it's amazing to think back isn't it when you you think of your younger self with a little video camera and just kind of showing stuff to friends and family and you're like oh that actually went somewhere that, that actually was something yeah yeah and I, I think around the time too i like uh, the biggest movie inspiration i watched was um amadeus and just seeing how you know if you you could take something that's in your head and with a you know a pencil or a pen or a quill in Mozart's case, and you just write it down on a piece of paper, you could transmit that idea to somebody else to have them play it. And that was like magic to me. That was like the most powerful thing in the world. Well, this is why music is one of the, the most powerful things in the world, in my opinion, as well. Like it's one of those hard to grasp things that just is, and we sort of tap into it, so to speak. Yeah, it. I feel like it's the a medium that's the most internal um, you you are, receive it so internally and, and so emotionally. Um, it's it, you can build a whole world through audio and, th and through music. Yeah, definitely. And it, it kind of sounds cheesy, but it, it is really so unique to me that it, it always captures my wonder how we've even got music to exist. You know, how we even came around to producing music and making music, even how we must have come up with it in the first place is incredible. Yeah. And there's just still so much more to explore too with with more technology coming out more mediums to play with it's just like you have more 
uh, canvas is the paint on. Yeah, exactly. More apps, more social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> Speaking of. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the social dilemma was, a, like I said before, it was an amazing eye opener for, um, for everyone, I believe. It was very, very popular. One of the most watched documentaries on, on Netflix, for sure. Um, and even I, who, you know, I try, I try and pride myself on the fact that I know about these things and I kind of know what social media is up to and what the algorithms are doing. But even for me, I was like, OK, well, maybe I didn't think about it that deeply or from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And it really shows a lot. Um, but how did you first get involved with this project? How did you first get brought on? Yeah, I, um, I had worked with Jeff Rolowski on his previous two films, Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, uh, more as a, a sound recordist and a camera operator, actually, for, for Chasing mm. Coral. And um, I uh, and I also did some additional music. I kind of slipped in a few additional music for the first Chasing Ice and then a few more for Chasing Coral. Nice. So kind of built built that up um, for Chase... For, um, the, for the social dilemma, I had originally started out as a sound recordist, recording all the interviews, and just kind of listening to all these experts talk about this uh, this material. I had I wasn't uh, I didn't have my expectations set on actually scoring the film, but I as I started listening to these, I just got inspired and started thinking about what well what a what would a film score actually sound like for this film, um, and what kind of ideas could you play with. And so I kind of, after these interviews, I'd go back to my studio and just start experimenting um, with all the synthesizers that I could get my hands on, uh, creating sounds and uh, mixing them with real acoustic sounds and digital sounds. Uh, I would, you know, create these tracks and sketches and send them on to Davis, the editor, and, and Jeff, and they liked where it was headed. And so they gave me the shot to, to score the whole film. That's incredible. And such a cool story as well that you were just recording the interviews and then you're like, oh, by the way, I've been uh, kind of writing music on the side about this. <laughs> stuff. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was, you know, it's because I was so kind of deeply embedded into the, the production, it really helped me understand the full scope of the, of the film and the subject matter and just kind of understand what the vibe should sound like. Yeah, and it must have been so cool to be that entrenched in the project mm -hmm, as well mm -hmm. from for that side because usually you'd be brought on at the end or like during production maybe. Yeah, um, I, I think it's really important to have that empathy for on the production side. You know what what these interviews uh, all you know, what they had to do to get these interviews and uh, where et, where the edits at where Davis is at with his edit. Um, yeah, super important. Did you get roped into editing the interviews afterwards? <laughs> uh, no, but I, I knew, you know, what they left out and what they, you know, kept in. And um, man, it's just, it's such an amazing uh, process. You know, how many, we, we must have done, you know, twice as many interviews that you actually see on the on the screen. But, you know, all, all of those interviews allowed us to, to hone in on the actual, like the meat of the story and get to the, to the core of it yeah i can imagine so what was it like making that transition because obviously you wrote music anyway but you were involved in a different capacity did you have to kind of switch hats or did you kind of naturally fall into it yeah i mean i what i typically do uh how i write music typically before this process was you know i i get the uh the full completed video and, and score to it but this was i just felt like um i wanted to to experiment, you know, kind of going back to my CU film days and just experiment uh, with writing music before I saw any edits, before I saw any cuts, and just explore um, explore the sound and just find that sound before I, I could see anything on, uh, on the screen. Do you think that kind of took the pressure off as well? You know, not even, because you weren't pitching for the project either, really. You were kind of just taking the inspiration from the interviews and the project itself and then just writing music and being like hey I think this would be really cool so you know is it a lot more relaxed yeah it, it definitely was relaxed and you know I, I didn't have any expectations for scoring it so this is just like writing music for the love of music um, and I think you know when you when you do that when you do it for the love uh, I think you come up with some really really cool things and plus it like later down the road when we are actually putting it to to uh, the screen, it did take the pressure off because I kind of had a head start when it got to December, and we needed to, you know, compose 80 more minutes of the of the score. Um, I kind of 
already found the sound and found the palette and uh, had a head start in that. Yeah, I was going to say, it's quite a quite a big soundtrack, isn't it? It's like, what, 35 tracks, I think, or something like that? Yeah, uh, it's it's about 89 minutes for a 93-minute film. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like three minutes, four minutes of silence. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, like, the biggest compliment I get is um, that nobody really uh, hears the music or notices the music, but they feel, like, uh, this uneasiness throughout, and that's kind of what I was kind of going for. Yeah, and what I love about it as well is almost like the natural evolution of the soundtrack that you don't pay attention to really, but it, it does kind of start off. I mean, even with the appropriately titled Normal World track, you know, <laughs> it's it's uh, it starts off with this nice piano motif and then just gradually the soundtrack just becomes more and more digital to kind of follow the protagonist's journey, I guess. Yeah, uh, Jeff and I had these conversations early on about that, you know, if, you know, do you have two separate scores to kind of distinguish the um you know the documentary side and the narrative side yeah uh and then we started kind of going that path down that path and thinking about you know how could you have these two sides battle each other you know you start out with that traditional orchestral score with the strings and piano and sort of the human side and then you just slowly morph that into this digital chaos uh down the road yeah and it's very metaphorical because it's almost like naively happy the original yep. track right the first yeah. track it's kind of like la 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 kind of mood you know exactly like people yeah. obliviously getting on with their day and then not noticing the i mean quote unquote evil of uh <laughs> social media that's happening without them knowing yeah yeah i wanted to have that first track just to you know be be happy go lucky but then there is something kind of nefarious behind it there's yeah. there's those digital elements that kind of sneak in and kind of tweak it a little bit and then it kind of starts to go downhill towards the end there yeah exactly it kind of like starts making you go hang on what's that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so when you first presented the kind of demo um to the director what, what was the kind of process from there so you went away you had the you had done some of the interviews not all of them i assume mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so you'd written some tracks and then gone hey what do you think yeah um i mean i the biggest thing i did was you know experimented with this uh this modular synthesizer instrument, which is this very crude um, instrument where you just create basically electronic noises and sounds and just played around with that a bit and, and combined that with some orchestral elements. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that's kind of how I found that, that sound where it was just like this undercurrent of noise and this, uh, you know, nothing is quite on pitch and nothing is quite in pitch and, just makes you kind of uneasy and I, when i sent that to um to davis you know he just worked that into some of these scenes and it just felt like yes that's that's it awesome and so did you just kind of get told to carry on with the same sort of thing or did you get some sort of direction as you were going through yeah um i mean there was there was a little bit of direction along the way but it was really uh you know everybody was kind of working at, at full gear or full speed um and so you know it was it was 80 minutes to get through so we were kind of finishing the edit, finishing music all at the same time. Uh, you know, I'd send tracks to, to them. Uh, they had edited it in and then, um, you know, I get a couple notes back maybe. And then, um, yeah, keep, just keep on pushing through. That sounds like a really kind of joyous project to work on. It's something that you had a hand in the, the kind of craft of, and then you just got to kind of play with it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I feel like I got a lot of, uh, creative license to, to kind of go down this path, um, to really explore that. I mean, with, you know, when you start out with a documentary or with a, any film score, you know, I kind of, you kind of start with a, a cerebral level. You kind of think about the intellectual side of like, okay, we're going to do this dilemma thing where the orchestral versus the, the synthesizer. But then as you start getting into it, you really start to like, uh, uh, what's the Beatles quote, you know, relax, uh, float downstream, uh, turn off your mind, relax and float downstream where it was just like this kind of going by the, by the seat of your pants and also just like <laughs> by going by intuition and just creating these worlds from these textures. And yeah, it was a really, really fun process. And it just really, you, you kind of just take your mind down this whole rabbit hole, literally. Yeah, I can imagine. And was there this danger of, I feel like when you're giving a lot of creative freedom, you have two ways to go, right? You either push the limits and really kind of see what you can do and what you get away with, or you're kind of too nervous to do that because you've been given so much freedom. You know, which way do you think you kind of went? <laughs> I, I really kind of pushed it. I think, uh, you know, I usually, 
I usually play it safe just just uh, from my experience with other with other scores. You know, I really pull back and and try to um, you know try to you know, make room for the dialogue and, and things like that. But there's some some moments where I just I, I was like, you know, this is a musical moment. I'm gonna go for it um, and kind of kind of go abstract a bit. Uh, I think there was one point in the score uh, that was you know when Ben's taking. Uh, a turn down the rabbit hole, and he's kind of going into this delusional world. Uh, you know, and it's also the the point in the score where we're talking we're talking about the pandemic and yeah. coronavirus, where it is this like kind of a kind of a callback to that original um, you know n totally normal world, but this is kind of like a fake side fantasy world um, that we're living in now. I, I you know it was like uh, I think I had created that score or that track ahead of time. Uh, as like an orchestral version of this theme that kind of plays throughout the, the film. And I just threw it in there and it was, it had a really eerie vibe to it. And so I kind of went down that path. That's awesome. And was there ever a moment where you're like, ah, this is too far really, but I'll see what they say. And they were still kind of like, yep, yeah, sounds good. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A few times, you know, I, I, at the very end when, um, you know, when uh, it's a kind of a grand moment when the whole world is changing. And I really wanted to have that lush uh, string sound to mm. the score and bring the humanity back. That that was like a the, another moment where I was like, OK, I'm going to just like push it and just and just go for it. Amazing. And it's so cool that they were so receptive to that as well, because you never know how that's going to go. Yeah, I, I, I really am fortunate to work with them. Um, to Davis with Davis and Jeff and the whole Exposure Labs team because they're just so creative and they love um, they love building this stuff. Um, they love movies. Amazing. And uh, thinking back, what would you say was your proudest moment right in the score for this project? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, my proudest moment, I think, was just like being able to finish it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, uh, that's always a winning point. <laughs> I mean, this is the biggest, this is the biggest, uh, challenge that I've had, I think as a, as a, uh, documentary filmmaker and composer is like just having this big weight on your shoulder and being able to, uh, accomplish it and then go to being at Sundance and like hearing it all. That was probably my proudest moment. It's just like, you know, the, again, that call back to the childhood is like seeing the reaction from, audiences for the for the work you did and yeah that was that was a really cool moment yeah and, and re, you know remind me of the process here it was at sundance but then did netflix pick it up from there or yeah um we premiered it at sundance um in january about uh, a little bit more than a year ago um and we hadn't uh you know put uh, you know coronavirus hasn't hadn't hit the pandemic hadn't hit um that was one of the last uh, screenings that we showed it live screenings that we showed it at yeah um, and netflix picked it up there um and then as uh the pandemic started picking up and we saw the the effects of um of you know this misinformation that was going on yeah we we knew we needed to update the film uh to make it feel relevant and um so we so we took the time in uh in the summer to do that and updated some of this some of the score we also had some notes on our end too just to um, fix it up but yeah so, and then we had it ready for september that's so cool and so did they just call you up and be like hey mark by the way it's been picked up by netflix <laughs> yeah yeah i was actually um i was actually there at sundance and you know kind of went through that whole roller coaster with them too and uh yeah it was a, it was a great great feeling oh i can only imagine so we've talked about your proudest moment. I'm sorry to ask this, but on the flip side, what was the most challenging moment of this project? Challenging moment, um, I think. Well, I mean, the subject matter itself is is incredibly challenging. I mean, when I was first on set listening to these interviews, you know, I had I had been using social media. Of myself, course, yeah. And, you know, you, you kind of have to if you're if you're an artist, and then hearing hearing you know the dark side of it, it was it really was like an existential crisis. You know, you're like, what is, what is my whole world you know, <laughs> based what on? What is life? What, what is life? <laughs> um, so I had to, you know, go back to that and think about that and think about my relationship to that. Um, but, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge was really the, the time crunch that we were up against. Um, I think I delivered the final tracks, you know, 5 a.m., the day before we left for um, 
for uh, Skywalker or the day oh, of man. that we left for Skywalker. That's intense. So it was it was really getting it right up to the last minute. Um, but we did it. We did it. Yeah, and you nailed it. And speaking about the social media side, I'm really curious now of like uh, two things. Mm -hmm. So did it affect the way that you use social media? I think it did. Um, some some for the better, definitely for the better. Uh, you know, I, for one, I just leave my phone out of the bedroom when I go to bed. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like a, one of those easy tips that you can check off and it really makes a difference. And then the other thing too is just like having a buffer between uh, me and my phone. Just to, just to question why I'm picking up my phone because oftentimes we just, you know, we feel that weight in our pocket. We want to just pull it out and just check it for some reason. Yeah, and sometimes you don't even realize you're doing it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and realizing what you, why you're doing it and just like the emotional state that you're in when you're using technology and using social media, it's really helpful to kind of understand what's going on inside your head. And how was it for you and the team when the film was done? And then you were all kind of like, so do we promote this on social media or what? How does this, <laughs> is that counterproductive? <laughs> it was a big struggle for the team. I mean, part of it is, you know, do you just like totally go cold turkey and, and um, go off of social media or do you meet people with where they're at? And I think that's what the team decided on is, you know, this is where we need to meet people um, and have a conversation. And, and there's a lot of positive sides to, to this technology too. And so we got to find all the all the positive sides and use that. Yeah, and I think that's it really, isn't it? It's kind of tailoring your use to get the positives out of it without really embracing the negative side. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I find myself, I mean, I've connected with so many uh, amazing composers and uh, orchestrators through social media, just like yeah. just reaching out and say, hey. But at the same time, you kind of, as you start using it and you start getting hooked on it, you start to feel... You know, sometimes you feel jealous or you start to feel anxiety about mm. what this person's doing. Um, so it's like you got to have those gut checks of is this really helping me or is this not not great for me? Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize how many of us go through the same sort of cycles with it. Like you say, you get a little bit anxious or you you get a little bit paranoid or jealous of other people's lives because you only see their social media highlights. Yeah. But you also get this weird withdrawal like this need mm -hmm. to pick up your phone or the need to tick off the red numbers. Yeah, the, the need to like update people and, and tell them who you are, what you're doing. And um, yeah, it's it's a struggle. It's it's like uh, it's just an everyday struggle. Yeah, and it really is a crazy rabbit hole, like we were saying earlier. Yeah, and it's but it's also like a incredibly powerful uh, image building tool, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, back when I was kind of uh, creating uh, films and, and, you know, doing a lot of commercial work, I'd be traveling, uh, out of the country a lot of times and I'd have to update my profile just to kind of shout out where I was at and things like that. And I had noticed that when I'd go to come back and talk to my friends and go to parties, they'd be asking, you know, Oh, where did you go? Um, you know, where did you travel next? Or talking about how I've been traveling around the world and I just realized that's the that's the image I've been putting off yeah is mark mark the traveler mark the, <laughs> the filmmaker and I realized you know what if I if I wanted to be a composer and if I really wanted to just go down that path why not just change everything I post to to being music wise and when I once I did that it was weird it was like this the switch people started thinking of me as a composer it's weird isn't it because it's not you that's changed it's the perspective of others that has changed yeah it's this it's this weird like celebrity um persona that you build and i i just I've, i feel so conflicted about it sometimes yeah same because you can basically craft yourself into whatever you want on social media yeah which is insane it's very um emotionally challenging too when you're kind of like thinking about who am i what is yeah. this world that I'm living in? Who, you know? Yeah. If, if this is how everyone sees me, is that what I am? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is by no means your first documentary. What did you bring from other documentaries you worked on to this one that you think really helped you? Yeah. I mean, um, I think uh, one of the biggest things I've learned from all of the other documentaries I've, I've worked on is uh, just like the the scheduling aspect. It's kind of the the housekeeping aspect of composing that you, that isn't as sexy, yeah, the, but, admin. <laughs> uh, the admin part of it. Yeah. And just knowing how to create cue sheets and stay on time and things like that. Um, 
but the you know the documentary I did before this, uh, it was a full bluegrass uh, style oh, genre nice. of music. So it was like completely different approach. Very um, different. <laughs> and that's what I love about you know working on documentaries or working on different um, different projects is like each one brings a whole new style or a whole new challenge. Um, with the bluegrass style, it was you know putting a bunch of inch, uh, you know musicians into a room and um, kind of being a little bit more loose on the on how you uh, produce the music. But with the social dilemma, it felt like we were on this um, we were on this journey where you just needed to get it locked in uh, a little bit a little bit better. Yeah, and you know how many styles have you sort of traversed over the last few years, having to do all these different shorts and documentaries and things? You must have kind of expanded your horizons musically quite a lot. Yeah, I, I think the like the first big calling card uh, short. It was a short documentary called "The Love Bugs," um, and that was really the first time I worked with like orchestrating real instruments and recording real instruments in the studio, and that was only three projects ago. Um, and that one, I just had a whole boot camp in learning woodwinds and learning strings and how to compose for strings. And um, luckily, I think along the way, I picked up some really amazing um, team members too, uh, Connor Abbott Brown and uh, Mark Venezia over at Wind Over the Earth, the studio I work with. Um, they've kind of come along the way. And as as you work on more projects, you just find those collaborator, collaborators to work with. Yeah, and how do you give yourself that sort of boot camp you know, when you need to learn something, how do you train yourself? Do you watch YouTube videos? Do you learn from other composers or? Uh, yeah, part of it is like, um, the, so there's like two sides. There's like the inspiration side, the stuff that'll get you fired up in the morning and make you want to actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the stuff that, you know, that's, that is the YouTube videos. And that is um, uh, watching, I, you know, I watched a bunch of uh, videos about composers and just kind of behind the scenes stuff and, I think even seeing, you know, especially when it goes to the, when there are documentaries about the person and you get to see them in their home or you get to see them working at their home studio, uh, even just seeing like, oh, they have the same refrigerator refrigerator as I, I do, you know, that's, <laughs> it's just like an empathy, empathy building thing where like, oh, I could do this. Um, I, I'm like them. <laughs> I have that fridge. I got this. <laughs> I have that fridge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, that's the inspiration side. And I, uh, you know, I listened to Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman, their master classes. Um, and then, um, on the, on the technical side, I think I just really, you know, I, you know, as, as soon as you start looking within your own network of, you know, who you could reach out to about just asking questions about orchestrating and the process, you know, I found those people and then, you know, sometimes you, you don't realize how much, you know, and even just talking about talking through the process with them, you kind of realize, Oh, I actually kind of know something about this and I could use my, my own approach to, to make the score. And so I, yeah, I mean, I, it was, it was really technically learning, uh, woodwind instruments, you know, the ranges for that. And, and, and that's all kind of stuff you can look up and uh, reference, but, um, it's, it's the inspiration side that I think that's the, the most challenging for composers is to just like, get inspired and get get fired up yeah and i suppose you just immerse yourself in that sort of content yeah 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 exactly so you mentioned collaboration before um do you collaborate on every project now or i i try to i mean i i used to um you know hold things a lot closer to the chest uh and now i'm i really like to open myself up and just try to see what collaborations come out uh what creative collisions happen when I, when you meet new orchestrators or you meet new songwriters, I, you know, I've kind of opened myself up to new mediums too and creating music for all different things. And I think that cross pollination between the different mediums helps you on your, on your film side and helps you on other uh, creative endeavors too. Yeah, definitely. And it's always interesting because it, it happens a lot more than people think. And I think, especially in the early days, composers are almost taught to be lone wolves. You know, they're kind of instructed that they will be freelance. They will have to kind of look out for themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily the case, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think I'm kind of under the creative mindset of you can learn any anything from anybody. And it doesn't matter who, who they are, um, you know, what status they're at or whatever. Um, it's anybody, ha every, everybody has, uh, something to, 
to offer. Yeah, definitely. Now, speaking of collaboration, I also wanted to mention that you recorded a really cool cover of I Put a Spell on You, originally by Screaming Jay Hawkins, with uh, Brandy Carlisle and Renee Elise Goldsbury. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That was that was an amazing opportunity that came along. and That's awesome. Yeah. And it's an amazing track as well. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, that really, that was one of those things where, you know, I just started getting down the songwriting rabbit hole and just thinking about how to produce songs. And, you know, when the film came out and we saw the reception that I was having around the world, I felt like there was something more that we could we could talk about and um, and write. And uh, we looked at that song, uh, I Put a Spell on You, which was, had an amazing moment in the film. And Nina Simone's version really just fit for that moment so well. Oh, it's definitely one of the best. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, so we started looking at that song. We thought about doing a cover um, for the movie, but we just didn't have a lot of time. Um, and we we explored it again. And, you know, the the lyrics in it are, are so simple, but yet they, the brilliance of the, the song is that, you know, they can fit to whatever context that they're, um, that they're put against. And this was a kind of a new, interesting con- uh, context, the social media side of it, you know, but the lyrics are, you know, kind of simple and short. And then we just felt like we wanted to add a little bit more to it too, to add to the conversation. Yeah. And that's where we uh, collaborated with Renee Elise Goldsberry uh, for the additional lyrics. Um, and then Brandy Carlisle came in for the, for the classic soulful, uh, side of the song too. Yeah. And it's a great cover, but how did you first get these people involved? Like it must've been amazing to kind of get out, get that far with this track. Yeah. I, I mean, the nice things about getting this film on Netflix and having it you know, be a really big, powerful film is that so many people got to watch it and were impacted by it and they wanted to lend their voices to the, to the movement. And so that's when we reached out to Brandy Carlisle because we knew she had she could carry that emotion in her voice for that for the original part. And then uh, Renee Elise Goldsberry, I had seen Hamilton uh, on TV during the summer and was so inspired by it. And it was kind of like just like a gem of hope in the, in the middle of the summer. Um, and every time we listened to the song um, Satisfied, we'd just be like getting goosebumps. And that was Renee Elise Goldsberry's song. And so we were like, we just kept on hearing that her her intonation and her voice uh, and her intensity for the additional lyrics and just felt like writing something additional with her in mind. Amazing. It must have been incredible to see it go so far, but you never even imagined back at Sundance that was what was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's that's just how it goes. Okay, so I'm drawing to my last couple of questions, sadly. Um, my first one being, what other projects are you working on at the moment that you can tell us about? the important bit at the end there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That I can tell you about. Um, I, yeah, there's a, there's a few projects that I'm kind of circling around that are circling me. Um, some, uh, documentary projects, uh, can't really say too much about them, but, uh, I like to work with directors just, and, and producers, uh, collaborators early on in the process of making the films. Just so just from going from the experience that I learned from the social dilemma is, you know, being able to, understand the subject matter at a very early stage so I can start creating music on a, on a peer level. Um, that way you, you create the palette and you create the, the ideas going into the project. Um, and then there's other mediums I'm also exploring too. I'm exploring songwriting, uh, more I've started writing a musical. Um, I've, you know, created music, I'm looking at creating music for, for other interactive uh, mediums and, and things like that. So I just kind of like to, you know, I like, I like challenges um, and I like putting challenges on myself to see where uh, my creativity can take my, myself. What is your dream challenge? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Well, I, um, I think when I was little, I used, I, my sister introduced me to a lot of horror films. Oh, nice. One of my favorite genres. <laughs> I know. I've always been a horror film uh, fan. And Social Dilemma itself is sort of like its own horror film. And people uh, think the score sort of sounds like that. Yeah. So I'm always kind of interested to, to explore that side of it. Because I think horror films are really interesting in that they can show the anxieties and, and the fears that are happening in, um, in society. And that's something I 
definitely want to explore uh, a bit more too. Yeah, and I suppose you can play a lot with the music side. You know, there's a lot you can do to influence the kind of emotion of the the viewer. Yeah. Um, how do you, you know, you think of the classic uh, horror film scores, but how do you push the, the genre beyond that? Um, yeah, I mean, rather than screechy strings, what else can you do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, there's, there's many more things you can take it, right? Right, yeah. Okay, so my last question, sadly. Um, it can be a bit of a doozy, though. So... If you could go back in time and give your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be? Yeah, uh, that's a deep question. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I get all sorts of answers for this one. I think, uh, you know, um, it takes time. Um, It's it's a marathon um, when you want to get somewhere, and oftentimes, like I said earlier, it's it's it is a winding road, and there's a lot of detours that you might take, and I think if you have a good compass to work on, uh, if you build your values and your morals early on, um, that will help a lot uh, as you start to navigate this hairy jungle of composing. And uh, I also think, you know, be easy, go easy on yourself too, because, you know, it'll, it's, it, you're going to beat yourself up a lot along the way. And especially with for young composers nowadays who are looking at, um, you were on social media maybe and kind of looking at the lives of other composers and, and comparing themselves to, to them. I think going easy on yourself because, you know, you're going to find if you have those, that compass and that moral, that moral compass, you're going to find your own path. Um, and also just, um, one, one piece of advice that Jeff Orlowski, uh, said at one point was, you know, be so good at something that, people can't help but listen to you or people can't help but to hear hear what you're doing. And I think um, that came in handy when I was uh, writing music for The Social Llama uh, or for the other uh, scores that I really, really wanted to do um, and I was really passionate about, but I didn't necessarily have all the experiences. I just wanted to show what I could do. And as soon as I proved that I could do it, then then people started listening. Amazing. And I think that's a fantastic note to leave it on. <laughs> I have to say, it's been an absolute pleasure, Mark. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Great. Thanks for having me. It was, it was great talking with you. It was amazing. So thanks again to Mark Crawford and thanks everyone for listening. Check out The Social Dilemma on Netflix. everyone this is sam thanks very much for listening to the sound architect podcast today i hope you enjoyed this episode if so there are many ways you can support the show which is incredibly appreciated obviously there's the financial way where you can support us on patreon which is patreon.com forward slash sound design uk however there are many other ways which also help such as liking subscribing reviewing commenting and sharing via whatever channel you listen on Thanks so much for your support already. It really is a work of passion for me, and I'd love to keep sharing the knowledge from all these talented and wonderful people. Thanks again, and catch you on the next episode.